Welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. So tonight, we're going to open up our phone lines and give you a chance to talk to the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731-6733. Any question that you have about COVID-19, we invite you to call in and ask. You are a big part of the show. Join the conversation tonight. Again, that number is 877-731-6733. And joining us live tonight from Omaha, Nebraska, is University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, and CEO and president of Union Pacific Railroad. Lance Fritz joins us tonight as well. Thank you both for being here. Dr. Gold, let's start with an overview of how widespread COVID-19 is in rural America tonight. Well, thank you, Christina. It's a great pleasure to join you and join our audience tonight, and of course, to have uh, Lance Fritz with us on this special show. Unfortunately, uh, COVID continues to spread uh, widely around the world. We're approximately adding about 200,000 cases per day uh, worldwide, of which between a quarter and a third, very closely to a third, uh, are in the United States. We've had several days over the last week where we've not only exceeded 50,000, 60,000, we've actually added 70,000 cases per day in the United States, now totaling as of just earlier today just over 4.2 million and 147,000 confirmed deaths from COVID. Now, if you look at rural America, what we're continuing to see is that there are hotspots, that is to say their spread of the virus in both large cities, and we talk about, of course, what's going on in California and what's going on in Texas and in Florida, but also in small cities and towns in the Midwest. We're seeing it in our farms and ranches, and for a long, long time, our, our rural communities knew nobody or never heard of a family member or a friend who was infected, but tragically, that is no longer the case. <clears throat> Most of our farmers and ranchers now have at least some friend, colleague, or heaven forbid, family member who not only was sick and diagnosed, but widely, possibly even hospitalized or worse than that. This is the heat map of the United States as of earlier today. And as you can see, based on the intensity of the color, there's still a strong trend across the southern United States, uh, all through South Carolina, Florida, uh, Louisiana, major parts of Texas. And then, of course, all of the activity that's going on in Arizona, and in California, both in rural and in urban communities. Unfortunately, uh, the trend not only continues to infect younger people, you know, in their late teens and 20s, uh, but also we're now seeing a shift back towards some of the older demographic, and that results, uh, as we've said many times, in hospitalization, intensive care unit stays, and tragically fatalities as well. So we're still very much in the middle of this complex battle, and I hope we're going to get some great questions tonight. I know we always do to have an opportunity to talk about how that battle's going and how rural America can respond most appropriately. Oh, we have so much to talk about, including some news on therapies and vaccines. We will get to that, I promise you. But let's talk to Mr. Fritz. Dr. Gold, you always bring us the best panelists, relevant panelists. And Mr. Fritz, we love to hear a little bit about your background, how you climbed the ladder to become the president and CEO of North America's premier railroad franchise. Well, Christine, thank you for having me this evening. And, you know, as opposed to climbing a ladder, it's really more like going through a maze. Uh, in my experience, uh, I started out being educated as an engineer. I worked on the shop floor of a, of a large corporation and then went back to business school to get a little broader experience, a little broader exposure about what the business world was like. Then I worked for a couple of different companies uh, in sales and marketing, operations, again, general management. And the way I joined Union Pacific uh, was uh, a recruiter I was using turned around and recruited me into the company. And, and that was about 20 years ago. And what I found attractive was the values of the, of the company, the team, the openness to leadership and scale. Uh, the scale is pretty, pretty phenomenal for uh, America's largest railroad. And through the last 20 years, I've just had a wonderful experience at Union Pacific. I've, I've uh, uh, been part of our sales and marketing team. I ran part of our operations. I ran all of our operations and labor relations and then became CEO about five years ago. 
Uh, and all along that way, Christine, the, the, the game plan wasn't one solid game plan. It was really a series of three to five years and then taking advantage of whatever opportunity showed up. Well, we know one thing is for sure, you would not be able to hold that position unless you really knew rural America. And we know that you do, so we look forward to tapping into your expertise tonight right along with Dr. Gold. And boy, your recruiter recruited you. That says a little something about you. And we're really excited to hear more of your story throughout the questions tonight. Our first call comes from Juanita in Beaufort, North Carolina. Let's listen. I would like to tell you that everyone needs to wear a mask, stay six feet apart, sanitize, and schools need to stay closed. Yeah, Juanita, you know, uh, let's talk about each of those components. Certainly, uh, you know, when I get asked all the time, uh, what is the single most important thing, the top three things that you can do, I always respond the same way. Wear a mask, wear a mask, and wear a mask. Uh, there is no question now that that prevents spread to other people, but it also protects each of us. And as I've said many times on this show before, you know, you, you just don't know who you're with and whether or not uh, they are at risk. And, you know, we'd like to think that some of our younger population uh, can be, uh, you know, minimally affected by this disease but you just don't know who's being treated for cancer, who's got you know, inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid arthritis, who's got diabetes, uh, who's being treated for heart disease. And in this day and age, there's so much, so much great function of people who are otherwise at risk. They come to work, they sit next to you, you know, they do their thing six feet apart like Lance and I are right now. And so we just have to be careful about each other and careful about ourselves. Six feet apart, obviously important. Uh, hand sanitizer, surface sanitization, very important as well. As far as the back to school piece is concerned, I'm sure we'll get other questions about that tonight. But let me just start off by saying that this needs to be an individual locality decision. It needs to be based on what the ability of the locality, the school district has, and not just within the school itself, but the community to control the disease. If they haven't had a case or a hospitalization in several weeks, I would say it's perfectly reasonable to consider under the right circumstances, social distancing, masking, sanitizers, to start to open school in a de-densified way. If on the other side of the coin, they're looking like some of our southern or western communities are looking today, where there's difficulty in getting testing, long time, turnaround time to get test results, incomplete case tracing, shortages of masks and other personal protective equipment, I would say that would be a very, very high risk decision to start to reopen schools, particularly when we know that young children, particularly 10 to 18 year olds, are very capable of spreading the virus, and as a matter of fact, may even be more capable than some of their adult uh, family members. So, uh, Juanita, you know, thanks for that great question. Right on. You know, Dr. Gold, you bring up some very valid points. Let's talk about how our understanding of the virus has actually changed as we learn more in transmission in general. A few months ago, we were worried about disinfecting all of our packages. Now it seems like mask wearing is the more important of the two. But how does what we know about the virus affect that decision of whether or not to reopen schools, especially if you have a hard time getting young kids to keep their masks on and socially distance. Yeah, so we have learned a lot about the virus and particularly about the transmission of the virus. We have learned that social distancing or what I like to call physical distancing mm -hmm. is more important. We need to be socially connected but physically distanced from each other uh, is critically important. We've learned, as I said a few minutes ago, that the use of a mask is very, very important. Uh, to protect ourselves. But what we've also learned, as this graphic shows, that the six feet is just a rule of thumb, and that if you can do seven feet, you're better. If you can do eight, even better yet. Because some of the recent data <clears throat> and, and the most recent information from the World Health Organization has shown that these micro droplets, particularly the very smallest of the micro droplets, can actually linger in the air. And uh, we, for a very long time, thought that the overwhelming majority of these droplets were large enough that in under six feet, gravity would pull them straight down to the ground. You'd walk on them, 
the viruses don't last very long on hard surfaces, and we'd be back in, in a safer place. But with this recent data that shows that live virus can be recovered, infectious virus can be recovered from these micro droplets that linger in the air, it just reinforces how important that the mask is. Because, the, it, let's face it, it's our coughing, sneezing, you know, we talked a bit previously about choir practice, projecting those microparticles uh, into the air. Those are the things that we need to prevent to keep ourselves safe and to keep others safe as well. And so we continue to learn more. You know, a week doesn't go by that we don't learn something else about the spread and the biology of this virus, about how vaccines may or may not work, how long lasting immunity may be. And we'll unpack that during the rest of the show tonight. But those are all things that, frankly, a month or two months ago, we really didn't understand that we learn and we now understand to be scientific fact. 60 days, that's all it took for our medical community here in America to really watch this brand new virus, gauge it. And, and like you said, Dr. Gold, you're still learning. Next up, Rick of Montana asked on social media, as cases rise in rural areas that can be difficult to access, do you think we'll run into problems getting medical supplies and equipment like ventilators to communities that need them? Well, I'll start with that. And then this is something that Lance might want to weigh in on mm -hmm. as well, because uh, certainly the railroads uh, are very important to the transportation of, of medical supplies and other critical uh, essential things, our food supply as, as well. Uh, you know, I think that there's a likelihood, Rick, you know, we're seeing a significant shortage today. Uh, of test supplies, and that's not due to transportation. I'm not quite ready to blame the railroad for that yet, Lance. That's a manufacturing issue. Mm -hmm. And it, believe it or not, it's these tiny little plastic pipettes that are used for the testing that has become the limiting factor. And so what has changed across the United States as a result of that is there are now test kits, meaning swabs and transport reagent, that were in tremendous shortage earlier this year but now are available so you and I can, you know, show up and get tested when we want to get tested. But the delays that we're seeing in the return of the test results are being driven by shortages that these large high throughput testing organizations are seeing. So what used to be able to be done in a 36 to 24 hour turnaround time is now taking 5, 7, 10, even 14 days. And if we can't turn these tests around more quickly, uh, while the individual who's symptomatic uh, may be able to quarantine and self-isolate, we can't do the contact tracing. That is to say, we can't run through the list of individuals that they have met and then get them tested. You know, you may have seen that there's, uh, you know, work been done by the NCAA recommending that all student-athletes that will compete in, in any competitive matches, and of course we're all thinking college football and other such things, uh, should, under best of circumstances, uh, be tested 72 hours before competition. Now, that implies that we'll have a reliable test result in well under 72 hours to figure out who's going to the locker room and who's not going to the locker room. And if we can't get that information back quickly and reliably, then uh, we're going to have a big problem on our hands. So, Lance, do you have any thoughts on, you know, transport of these materials to small rural communities? Absolutely, uh, Dr. Gold. So one of the things that happened early when COVID struck and when it particularly impacted China is supply chains got disrupted because the manufacturing and shipping at origin was unavailable. And that kind of cleaned itself up by, call it late April, early May. And the remainder of the disruption that still exists today is mostly about demand spike for items that the manufacturer or manufacturers of just weren't prepared for. So we do play a role as a, as a railroad in transporting virtually everything that's related to testing and as well as the personal protective equipment for care providers. But in that context, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to experience uh, a little patience in allowing these supply chains to kind of catch back up. There's also a lot of dialogue on trying to onshore and nearshore back to the United States or North America production that had gone over to Asia. And, and many of our customers are talking about that to a degree. Uh, but the, the world's a very big economy and it's largely connected today. 
And for many of you that are that are watching today, it's an important outlet for some of your production, for your grain, your soybeans, your corn, your DDGs, uh, and your proteins. So, you know, the, the answer isn't bring it all back to America. The answer is let's get production up and some nearshoring, onshoring probably needs to exist. Uh, and let's uh, practice a little patience. And, you know, Christina, there's no question that the demand for this testing and for the personal protective equipment has dramatically ramped up. I mean, clearly, when we broke 70,000 confirmed cases a day, uh, almost unprecedented use of hospitalization, uh, th th there's a huge demand for the supply and, and equipment across the United States. And, uh, you know, in many other parts of the world, we've actually seen a fall off in demand, fortunately. So there's some opportunity to internationally shift the production, but uh, it doesn't happen overnight. So the, the single best thing we can do is to try to control the spread of the virus. There's no yeah. question about that. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, you know, Lance, Union Pacific is part of the lifeblood of America's supply chain, like you were mentioning, transporting corn, transporting sorghum. Talk about how COVID-19 has altered what your trains are carrying, because I understand you also transport items from Amazon. Yeah, sure. So we've seen and experienced the significant spike in e-commerce. It's showing up for us in what we call our parcel business. And in that business, we've seen some days from our parcel shippers, so think UPS, FedEx, Amazon, that are as big as Black Friday. And that means there's a lot of retail shopping shifting to, uh, to the web. I've heard uh, some of the executives in those industries talk about five years of e-commerce growth happening in about a two-month period. And the question is, is it going to go back? You know, are, are, are people going to get comfortable shopping back in brick and mortar, mm -hmm. or are they going to keep buying uh, with greater habit through e-commerce? I, I think it's probably going to be at least some of that shift is permanent. I mean, it's pretty easy to uh, go online in a couple of clicks and you get pretty much what you want. Exactly. And, uh, so I think you're right. It's going to be a balance. And it, we, we call it the next normal, uh, meaning it's not going to look like it did in the past and it's going to be some kind of hybrid uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who never shopped online started just over the past few months for the very first time. Now, if that is the case, that I would imagine would be good for business for you, Mr. Fritz. But uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more down the road. We know that the economy, the way that it's going, is rippling out all across the board. So we are going to talk about that, even impacting Union Pacific. But first, we want to go to Ken of Pennsylvania. He says, I'm a member of the Moose Lodge, and our membership is dropping. So the community isn't getting the financial support we're able to typically provide. Do you have an idea of how long after the vaccine is released that group events like bingo can resume? Ken, well, we are hoping the vaccine will be available in the early winter or certainly, uh, as I've said earlier, by the time Santa comes down the chimney, uh, maybe there'll be a pack of vaccine uh, in, in the sack or at least on the sled. Uh, but... Uh, and maybe even earlier than that. Uh, we learned today at one of the major manufacturers trials, uh, phase three trial, which is the efficacy trial, uh, will go live. Uh, and so uh, they will need to enroll about 30,000 uh, individuals uh, who are willing to participate in that research trial. It, it, I'm sure it's gonna take uh, at least a month, if not more, and then there'll be some period of time to analyze the data. But Ken, the real answer to your question is how fast the vaccine production can be scaled. Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to get to herd immunity in the United States, we're probably going to have to have immunity between 200 and 250,000, 250, I'm sorry, million Americans. Uh, that's about two thirds of the population. That's the uh, public health estimate of what it's going to take to control the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that means that we're going to need to manufacture the, uh, the vaccine, get it distributed, and get American citizens to show up and, uh, and, and get vaccinated. And that's just not going to happen overnight. Okay. Well, on that note, we are going to pause for a moment. But on the other side of this break, we are going to ask Dr. Gold the latest therapy news, the latest about vaccines, and he is prepared to take your questions. Remember, our phone lines are open. We'd love to hear from you tonight. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this.
Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, world-renowned doctor. We get to have him each and every Monday, Dr. Jeffrey Gold. And also joining us tonight, we have Lance Fritz, the CEO and president of Union Pacific Railroad. So we have the panel of experts ready to go, and we're ready for your questions. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Our next question comes from Craig of South Carolina. He writes, how is the supply chain recovering after the backlog we had in May? Are safety standards at packing plants working out, or have workers developed herd immunity? Craig, the, uh, you know, it probably varies a great deal from industry to industry. You know, there was an awful lot of attention uh, earlier in the spring, uh, specifically, for instance, around the meatpacking industries. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of work that our university did, both in providing testing, personal protective equipment, uh, physical spacing uh, between the workers in the meatpacking industry. And as a result of that, I think at least for the meatpacking plants that I'm most familiar with here in our part of the country, I think they're all open again. Uh, they're not at full capacity of production, but they're really recovering nicely. And most importantly, the communities that these individuals live in, uh, which were very severely affected by the meatpacking infections, uh, have really calmed down greatly to the point that there were very, very few confirmed new cases of uh, covid uh, in those local communities, which is critically important because it's a partnership not only between where they work but where these uh, folks live. Now, unfortunately, in, in other aspects uh, of our communities, uh, that is not the case. And, uh, you know, we've looked recently as states have reopened uh, their uh, spas and their uh, watering holes, their, their places that people go to have a cold drink on a, on a hot summer night. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have not seen an adequate amount of physical distancing in those areas. And what a lot of people think is that it's the generation of those individuals uh, who enjoy those sorts of luxuries. And I understand there's a huge amount of pent up demand to be with other people, to engage socially. You know, we are human beings are social animals. We don't like being isolated. We don't like being alone. And when, in the warmer weather, uh, there's a tremendous amount of temptation. And so uh, we really need to be very, very cautious about that. Uh, it's just going to vary, I think, Craig, from community to community. And our Lance, what have you seen in the railroad business? What has it been like for you and your employees? Yeah, you know, so we've definitely seen the impact you've talked about, uh, Dr. Gold, in terms of the protein industry being shut down and, and having a difficult time satisfying demand. Uh, we saw a few other industries see the same impact. Um, certainly the automotive industry in the United States literally got shut down. That was less about uh, COVID uh, epidemics showing up on their, in, in their doorstep and more about non-essential. Uh, what we see now is most industry in the United States is back up and running. And when I think about my own workforce, as a leader, our number one goal is the safety and health of our employees. And so what we do is we follow CDC guidelines and the guidelines of uh, uh, local community leaders like Dr. Gold who can help us interpret what the safest behaviors are. So we do everything from uh, mandating masks or facial coverings uh, when you're in common areas and not in your workspace. Uh, we uh, encourage personal hygiene and have uh, hand sanitizer available virtually everywhere. The same thing with wipes to clean uh, your surfaces. And then we go so far as in our elevator lobbies to show where social or, or physical distancing locations are and we limit how many people can be on an elevator. And we actually have gone so far as to put nanotechnology on all the handles and push buttons in our building, in our office environments, that is uh, microbe killing nanotechnology. It lasts for about three months, then you gotta replace it, but it, it's not sticky, it's not wet, and it does a wonderful job. So. We're doing all kinds of things to try to maintain and the has health it, and, and has it worked? Workplace. I mean, I think that's really the bottom line here. Well, so far, Dr. Gold, again, I go back to our positive rates and our presumed yeah. positive rates, and, and it looks like we're under control. Wow. Great strides you've taken to safeguard your workforce at Union Pacific. Now, earlier today, Dr. Fauci said that a COVID-19 vaccine 
may be available as early as October, but then he said, more realistically, November. What are you hearing from the medical community about vaccines and even therapies? Yeah, so let's start with vaccines, Christina, because uh, there's an awful lot of attention about the availability of a safe and an effective vaccine. So currently, there are over 160 vaccine, what we call constructs, different types of vaccines uh, that are under development. The majority of these are still in the research laboratory, but there are probably a good 20 or so approximately that are either in phase one, phase two, or phase three clinical trials. So as this graphic will tell you, uh, 19 in phase one, uh, 13 in phase two, and this is from earlier today, uh, and four in phase three. So phase one is just an early safety trial. So they look for healthy volunteers, mostly young people, no comorbidities, no other diseases, and they're just looking for demonstration of safety of the vaccine. Uh, phase two is also a safety trial, but it looks for younger and older individuals, people with some medical uh, issues that they may be facing. But again, it's a very limited uh, safety trial. Now, phase three is when you get into large-scale efficacy trials. So you may have read today that one of the vendors started their uh, first trial of 30,000 Americans that will need to be enrolled uh, in this trial uh, over the next month or so. 15,000 in the treated group and approximately 15,000 uh, in the placebo group. So they'll all get the vaccine. Uh, typically, it's going to be more than one dose, we believe. Probably two, could be as many as three doses of the vaccine. And then they're going to look and wait and see, uh, particularly in high-risk areas, uh, whether these individuals will go on and actually develop uh, the COVID-19 infection. And of course, uh, you know, perhaps tragically, perhaps not, there are parts of the United States where there are huge numbers of ongoing infections. You know, we remember the heat map we looked at just a few minutes ago. Uh, you could pick any part of Florida or Texas or uh, large parts of California or Arizona and go to those large cities where they're seeing test rates well north of 10 percent, probably as high as 15, 20, 25. I saw one number today of 28 percent positive wow. tests. Uh, and choose that population to do their testing in. Mm -hmm. And you'd have a pretty good determinant, you know, in a short period of time. So the higher the prevalence in the community, the faster the vaccine can be tested. And so I'm, you know, guardedly optimistic. I, I think Dr. Fauci is right that uh, we'll certainly have some preliminary information. I actually think uh, before uh, November, I think at least from a safety and preliminary efficacy uh, and indeed, you know, if we can find out the uh, efficacy data before the end of the trial, I mean, there's no magic about getting to the end of the trial. What you really want to do is get to the point that you have proven uh, that the vaccine is effective, which could be long before the end of the trial. And that's mm -hmm. why there are so-called uh, safety boards that, that look at that and look, they look at the ethics of how the trials are actually uh, being conducted. So let's take a minute and just talk about uh, uh, therapeutics, antivirals, uh, really not a lot new here. Uh, the, the hospitalization rates uh, remain uh, fairly stable, unfortunately, across the United States. The remdesivir still turns out to be one of the most widely used agents. Uh, the low-dose steroids, the dexamethasone, uh, that was a subject of a large European trial, uh, seems to be effective. Some of the other trials of anti-inflammatory agents, uh, the inhibitors of uh, the inflammatory process, do not look as promising uh, as remdesivir and remdesivir plus uh, some of these low-dose steroids, dexamethasone. Uh, the preliminary data uh, on some of the monoclonal and polyclonal antibody studies is still inconclusive, but those large trials have yet to begin. We're probably going to start to see some of that data uh, come to us, I would hope, uh, by mid to late August, which would be really nice, because even if we get these vaccines rolled out in, you know, hundreds of millions of doses, uh, we're still going to have people get infected, we're still going to have people hospitalized, and we're still going to need therapeutics in order to prevent, you know, all of the tragic consequences uh, that occur from this disease. So in the area of vaccine, and in the area of therapeutics, 
uh, things are definitely moving in the right direction. That is such good news. Thank you so much for that. We are going to go to the phones. I want to give you the number 877-731-6733. Thank you for your patience. Bill from Michigan, go right ahead. Uh, hello. First, I'd like to say uh, thank you for being one of the few sources of usable information I've been able to find on the TV lately. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, my question is uh, about antibodies. Uh, from what I understand, uh, up until now, I've been hearing that uh, whatever antibodies you might have because you had COVID uh, go away after a while. And one of the main reasons I'm calling is I just had typical blood work for the usual diabetes and cholesterol and all that. And they flat out refused to do the COVID uh, blood test. Uh, so... So much for uh, getting a test if you need it. Uh, any comments or uh, new information on that? Well, Bill, th these are very important questions. First of all, I'm sorry that you couldn't get your blood tested. Uh, that will hopefully become available in your community sooner than later. So there are multiple different types of antibodies that we make uh, against viruses, bacteria, other infections uh, that we may have. And we know with beyond a shadow of a doubt, particularly if you make high titers of antibodies to what we call the spike proteins, the proteins that are on those little projections from the virus. You remember, we call it a coronavirus because it looks like a crown and it's got those projections. Well, those projections are how the virus sticks onto your cells and attacks your cells and enters your cells. So if you can uh, incapacitate those little projections so it can't stick onto your cells, uh, that equals survival. That equals killing the virus and stopping its replication uh, in your body. So it is unquestionably true that if you're exposed to any infectious agent, uh, it doesn't make any difference what it is, you will make antibodies. And those antibodies will start to peak roughly 10 to 14 days uh, after your infection. And then over a period of time, which could be weeks, it could be months, the levels will actually fall. But that doesn't mean that your body has forgotten. I mean, if you think about it, you know, most of us uh, were either immunized for things like measles or uh, rubella or other things, you know, as a child. And yet, if we were exposed to that today, uh, our white blood cells uh, are capable of remembering that fact and manufacturing antibodies in, in high titer, in high quantity, in order to fight that off so we don't get sick. So uh, I would say, Bill, that even though antibody levels do fall, uh, and it is important to be able to measure them, uh, particularly in the acute phase, meaning less than a month after somebody was sick, or, by the way, less than a month after somebody gets immunized. Because I think what's going to happen as these vaccines start to roll out, we're going to see different effects in different people. Mm. So, I, you know, the very young and, and the child age people are, mount a much brisker uh, and longer lasting immune response. Older people, particularly people who are on multiple medications, diabetics, people who are on immunosuppressive medication, folks that have been treated for cancers, for instance, will mount a less firm and a less sustainable uh, uh, antibody response. And therefore, we're going to need to do some measurements for those. So we're going to need the right test bill, and it needs to be timed uh, in, a, in a useful way. I would say routine testing right now for people that, are, that, have no, that have had no illness and that have had no exposure to COVID probably is not meaningful because even if it came back negative, you have no way to know whether you had antibodies at one time earlier and don't any longer have them now. But I think for people that have been infected and certainly as we're doing these trials of these uh, new vaccines that are coming out that we just discussed, we're going to want to have good testing available. And, uh, you know, hopefully it'll be finger stick testing. Right. Thank you for that call, Bill. That leaves a line open for you tonight. We're going to go back to the phones. Terry from Virginia. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. Terry. I think we may have lost Terry, but we do have Margaret of Missouri, and she writes on social media, my brother lives in rural Kansas, and he got coronavirus. He did not have to go to the hospital, but he did have a bad cough. Can the virus cause irreversible damage to a person's health? 
Uh, Margaret, you know, uh, the unfortunate the question uh, answer is yes. Uh, and we have seen now increasing evidence of the impact on multiple different systems. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, what the long-term effects of these infections are going to be uh, is pretty much unknown right now. Because you think about it, the very first infection uh, of coronavirus disease was diagnosed, uh, you, know, the, you know, the end of December in China. We didn't really start to see an explosion of cases in the United States here until uh, late March. Uh, early March was when we just first started uh, to see cases in the United States. And uh, we are well aware of what the short-term effects are. But there's also information that's coming about kidney and renal effects, about heart and vascular effects. We've talked earlier and, and in other shows about the pediatric inflammatory disease, very akin to so-called Kawasaki syndrome uh, that occurs, uh, which is an immunologic effect uh, that causes inflammation of blood vessels in children, typically age 6 to 10, which may have long-lasting effects uh, as well. And so we continue to study this. There was just recently a paper that came from Europe that looked at about 1,200 individuals who were hospitalized, so they had pretty severe COVID-19, and they demonstrated that over half of them had significant cardiac effects from the infection in hospital. But the interesting thing was, at about a month after discharge, when they were looking well, feeling swell, ready to go back to work or school or whatever, and these were individuals that had no underlying cardiac disease, one out of seven still had significant cardiac impairment. And so, uh, uh, Margaret, the, the answer is pretty simple, and that is we don't know what all of the long-term effects of this infection are going to be. We continue to study it very carefully. But again, anything we can do to stop the spread is going to stop both the short-term and the long-term effects and also get our economy uh, back to normal as quick as possible. Oh, amen to that. We are going to pause for a quick break, but our phone lines are open. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center. After this, we still have time for your call. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor and world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold. And joining us tonight, CEO and President of Union Pacific Railroad, we have Lance Fritz. Okay, our next question comes from John of North Carolina. He writes, we're third-generation hog producers, and if the market keeps slipping, I'm afraid I'll have to lay off some of my workforce. Any idea? when we'll be able to put this virus behind us? Oh, John, I think uh, the answer to that question really is going to lie in when we can develop sufficient herd immunity. <clears throat> and that's going to mean widely available vaccine. And we've discussed a few minutes ago on the show uh, the fact that the vaccine manufacturers are very confident about their trials. And some of the early data, frankly, is extremely positive. We then talked a bit about uh, getting the vaccine out to the communities. And as Lance said, transportation system is intact. I'm going to guess you create plenty of capacity uh, to get the vaccine shipped. But at the end of the day, I think it's going to come down to the distribution of the vaccine into small, local, rural communities. And, of course, the willingness for you, John, and your family uh, to be immunized, uh, particularly early on. I think a lot will come from the safety trials uh, from the vaccine to reassure America. And of course, when the Food and Drug Administration, when the FDA renders these vaccines to be safe, that's going to be the trigger for the level of confidence that, uh, that we're going to need. So I am hoping, again, uh, by the winter, certainly by the beginning of the next year, that we've got pretty wide distribution. I know that manufacturers are currently gearing up to manufacture hundreds of millions of doses of, of these drugs, uh, and that hopefully uh, the, the distribution systems will be in place. And I don't mean the trains and the trucks. Right. I, I mean the people that would actually do the vaccination process. I mean, we may need to get to the National Guard and to, you know, uh, clerks and, and pharmacists and, and everybody, you know, takes a job in... Uh, immunizing their, you know, one after the other. I mean, I could teach you to do that. <laughs> well, and we talked about how uh, the current population 
doesn't get immunized against the flu every year to the extent right. they could. I, I think about our own workforce, and we probably have 60% of our employee base take the vaccine. That way exceeds what happens in the United States broadly. Sure. And to, to, get, to get in front of COVID, we're, we're going to have to have those numbers. Well, we're not only going to have to have those numbers, but frankly, we're going to have to get a lot of people flu vaccinated uh, early on. You know, the vaccines usually come out shortly after Labor Day, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to have a very, very aggressive campaign because the last thing in the world we're going to want to do is immunize for COVID and the flu at the same time. And early stages of COVID and early stages of the flu regrettably look alike to us because mm. they all come on with fever, they come on with body aches, they come on with you know, some elements of shortness of breath, congestion, sinus, you know, issues, et cetera. And uh, you put all that together and you can't separate the two, you're going to end up with a lot of hospitalization. So anything that we can do to drop the flu numbers this year is going to be key. So I really appreciate the fact that you uh, offer the vaccine uh, to your workforce and uh, that 60% sign up. I know I get immunized on video every year just to make the point that the chancellor gets the you know, uh, the, the flu vaccine, and uh, hopefully that'll work. Lead by example. We appreciate that about you, Dr. Gold. You walk your talk. And another man who does is joining us on the phone right now, our CEO and founder, Patrick Gotch. Thanks for joining us, Patrick. Go right ahead. Yeah, Christine, I'm, I'm calling in with my dumb question of the week. <laughs> Never. Uh, but before I ask that, I want to thank Dr. Gold and and Mr. Fritz, of course, for being our, our guest again this week. But, uh, you know, by now, Dr. Gold, everybody knows to wash their hands and wear a mask and social distance. And with all that going on, plus it being the uh, heat of summer, which was supposed to have some effect on the, on the virus spreading, why are, you know, I see all these numbers every night about, uh, you know, how much the, the numbers are going up. But in tracing it, where where are these numbers going up from? And then I got a second question too. Um, what the it appears that the virus is evolving, and you know, with school starting up now, and and uh, all these uh, kids going back to school, and and people just assuming that uh, it can't affect uh, small children. Um, who's keeping an eye on that? to make sure that is the case. And why wouldn't the virus affect small children if it affects everyone else? So Patrick, uh, two good questions. Let's start off with a question about heat and humidity. We do get asked that a good deal. And uh, there was a hope, although never an assurance, that this particular type of coronavirus would be sensitive to heat and humidity. Regrettably, that has not turned out to be the case. Uh, it is slightly uh, injured, if you will, by heat, particularly uh, by dry heat, which is why on, on surfaces, you know, think tables, uh, you know, uh, outdoor furniture, things of that nature, uh, it doesn't last as long as it does indoors, particularly on moist surfaces, you know, think countertops, restrooms, uh, doorknobs, uh, et cetera. However, the counter feature there is that in the warm summer weather, we have a lot of people, particularly younger people, uh, that are out enjoying the summer weather, socializing, uh, you know, uh, and maybe they're not monitoring them, themselves as carefully as they should. Maybe they're not washing their hands as much as they can. They're certainly not wearing masks as much as they need to. And they're not socially distancing. I mean, you know, I'm, tragically, I've seen so many pictures uh, of individuals, uh, you know, at the bar on a Friday night sitting right next to each other, enjoying themselves, and frankly spreading that virus. There's recently a story of, uh, of choir practice in one of our southern states where there were 97 members of this church choir, and one of them turned out to have COVID, and 90 members of the choir ultimately got infected uh, with the virus. You know, we just recently saw the story in the media about the Florida Marlins, mm -hmm. and uh, and the loss of their home opener game as a result of, uh, you know, about 15 to 17 individuals uh, who are infected. And that's with access to the absolute top tier of testing and the most meticulous surface cleaning and, and things of that nature. And so these, this physical distancing is, is absolutely key. 
Now, your other question dealt with the changes in the virus and, and how that uh, affects the younger generation. So it's really a two-part question, Patrick. The first part really dates with the question of, does the genetic material of the virus change? Does it mutate? And the answer to the question is, it has and continues to mutate, to change at a fairly good clip. However, these are relatively minor changes which we do not believe are going to have an impact on the effect of the vaccine. Now, you know, I've been very careful to say we do not believe. We don't know for 100 percent assurance there could be a major genetic shift that will occur, similar to what happens with flu virus every year. Uh, these are very so-called sloppy replicating viruses, which means they don't, re they don't reproduce in a way that's completely reliable. And so a major genetic shift could occur. Younger children, our youngest children, our population, you know, between, uh, I don't know, uh, pre-K and eight uh, years of age, let's say, <clears throat> they seem to be more resistant to the infection and still can carry and transmit the virus. And that may just be simply the fact that, uh, that they, are, they tend to have a more capable immune system. You know, we know from uh, all sorts of scientific research that our children have the most aggressive immune system. They deal, you know, they incubate viruses all the time. <clears throat> I've learned from uh, my own grandchildren that preschool is an incubator of virus. Uh, and, uh, you know, they dutifully do bring it home. They get over it in 24 hours or 36 or 48 hours. And uh, you and I, Patrick, uh, well, we're knocked out for the better part of the next week or two. Uh, and so we have to be, uh, you know, cautious about that. But that's not due to mutation. That's due to the uh, immune capabilities of the younger generation. All right. Thank you. Great questions, Patrick. Outstanding. Diana from Missouri, you are up next. Go right ahead. Good evening, sirs. Uh, I tuned in late by listening to your uh, the gentleman you were talking to before me. I think you kind of answered my question. Uh, what's your thoughts on wearing the mask? I hear so many pros and cons, and I do wear a mask when I go out. I'm older, uh, but I just wanted to know what your thoughts were. Well, Diana, the data is pretty clear. Uh, so I'm going to speak now from the scientific side of it because I don't view it as a political issue. I don't view it as a sociologic issue. To me, uh, wearing a mask unquestionably protects other individuals that you are with, particularly indoors, particularly in close environments, even if you can stay six feet away from other people. We know that when we cough, when we sneeze, we project microparticles six feet, eight feet, 10 feet. There's even a study that shows you can recover them 12 feet away. We also know from scientific, quality scientific studies that the mask protects you, that even cloth and paper masks, not just N95 respirators, but cloth and paper masks are protect an individual and they trap these uh, moist particles, micro droplets as they're called, in the fabric and you don't breathe them in. Yeah. And so it's been, it's absolutely crystal clear. You know, again, uh, you know, when I get asked, what's the single best thing we can do to get our kids back to school? It, today, tomorrow, and the next day, it's wear a mask, wear a mask, and wear a mask. And uh, all really important. I see you've got yours, Lance. Absolutely, right? Dr. Gold. Uh, as a business leader, uh, I'm a believer. We mandate masks on our property for our employees and visitors. And the reason we do is it's kind of a, it's a manifestation of a value we hold dear. We call it courage to care. And if we see somebody who needs some help or uh, is at risk, we do something about it. We see something, we say something, we do something. And this is a physical manifestation of respecting each other and looking out for each other. I've got your back. And my mask is a physical manifestation of that. And, you know, uh, just to add to that for a minute, Christina, because this is such an important subject, you know, as a practicing cardiac surgeon for 25 years, I got up in the morning, put on my surgical scrubs, uh, put on my cap and gown and mask and, and went to work and typically spent 12 to 16 hours a day in the operating room every day, frequently seven days a week. And no one in, on the team ever thought twice about putting a mask on. 
I mean, we were, I wouldn't say it's the most comfortable thing in the world, and of course we know that, but at the end of the day, who we're protecting? We're protecting our patients, and that was key. We, no one would ever want to do anything that would put our patients at risk. And so as a result of that, we wore a mask. And, uh, you know, truth of the matter is you get used to it. And if that's the total price it takes. Now, having said that, there are some people who cannot wear a mask mm -hmm. because of underlying lung disease and things <clears throat> about that, of that nature. Ask your healthcare professional if you're in that category. But those are few and far between. I love that as well. It's, it's a physical manifestation of showing others that you care, a tangible form of the golden rule. Excellent way of putting that. Okay, we are running out of time, but I do want to pose this question to both of you to get your different perspectives. Dr. Gold, Lance, do we need, what do we need to do at this point? What can we do to ensure that our country and our economy can get running again at an improved capacity, finally humming along? like a freight train once again. You want me to go first? Dr. Yeah, go Gold? right ahead. I don't I. So the, the things that... Uh, like a freight train. Yeah, like a freight train. The things that I can do, one, I'm a business leader uh, for a railroad in the transportation industry. We're an essential industry. So I can make sure that I'm looking out for the health and safety of my employees, of the communities that we serve, so that we can continue to provide all the things we depend on in our lives. The food we eat, uh, the clothing we wear, the building material for our shelter, the things that we enjoy like TVs. So that, that's one thing I can do. A second thing I can do as a member of I, my community is, is I can help that community react to and understand and deal with the impacts of COVID-19. So that means being involved and engaged and, and being part of the dialogue and the decision making, or at least the support of the decision making when it comes to how do we open businesses safely? How do we open schools safely? And then the third thing I can do is I'm a father and I'm a husband and I'm a family member. So I, I can make sure that my family is cared for and looked after and treats COVID as something that's serious and is going to be around for a while. So that means we in our personal lives practice physical distancing and wearing facial coverings and, and all the right hygiene habits. And it also means when the vaccine is available, as soon as it's available to us, we're first in line and we're gonna go ahead and take it because I think it's an important aspect of creating herd immunity and getting us all back to normal. I think that's very well said, Lance. The, o the only thing I would add to that is that each of us has a moral and ethical responsibility to protect our fellow citizens. We will always protect our family members and friends, but we need to be more broad in our thinking than that, and we need to protect the communities that we care about. And all of the things you suggested are exactly the right way to do it. Outstanding. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for spending time with us. We know how busy the both of you are, so taking this valuable time away from you to be with our audience, it means the world to us. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Union Pacific Railroad President and CEO Lance Fritz, thank you again for joining us. At 8 Eastern, we have a very special show coming your way, a special edition of Rural America Live. It's a very first of its kind, in-depth interview with the founder and leader of Bass Pro Shops, Johnny Morris. You're gonna meet him like never before and we'll take you inside the granddaddy of all outdoor stores, 8 Eastern. See how his love for the outdoors fuels his passion for conservation. And we'll see you here next week.